It's why you continue honoring the Lord because of God's goodness. The children are heading off into their classes, hallelujah, and we're going to get into the Word. Are you here for some good word? I want to share with you, uh, last Friday, after our Harvesters Conference, this, uh, there it is, being a little rebellious there, man. Last Friday, um, Friday night of our Harvesters, I started a message. I told you it was a two-part message. You all remember that? In all reality, it's more than that. But um, it's something that I really feel we need to hear because of the season that we're in. And after that 40-year anniversary, you heard me use the illustration that the 40s. Fur- fur- the <laughs> Brother Oscar, I'd love you if you bring me a bottle of water from someplace. Take it from somebody. I don't care. Um, no, just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Ah, you're the greatest. Say it again. Say it again. He's the greatest. Um, you heard me do the illustration of the trophies. You guys remember this, the illustration of the trophies, the the uh, the university that put out trophies to all the leaders and even to the to not the leaders, the great players. I don't know what they're called. I'm not a sports guy. Okay, you got to forgive me on that. Uh, and then the coach, and then you know, big old plaque he got, and then he dumped it in a trash can. And silence went over for a while, and each, each, after about a few minutes, each one of those young men that got a, that got a trophy walked over to the trash can and, and threw theirs in the same trash can. And he told them he's, he had a, a year on that, on that trash can. He, that year is gone. And, and those trophies aren't going to make you play better in this season. We have to determine in our mind to make this season that's coming up a better season than the last. Well, I feel that it's the same in the kingdom of God. As a pastor, I want the church to understand vision. I want them to understand destiny. I, I preach messages on that. I, that, that Friday night, getting, a, getting an understanding into the, into the group. I started it even months before, a good month and a half, two months before, talking about uh, we are God's chosen people. The problem with us is we don't always feel chosen. We assume that being chosen means no problems. Eh, Wrong answer. Not true. Not true. Being chosen actually means you're going to have wars, trials, battles. Because everything that's worth its salt, everything that has some kind of goodness has to be proven. So I had a, a couple of directions and ideas. And I want to talk about vision this morning. Because 40 years are behind us. 40 years are behind us. Now you might be thinking, yeah, I wasn't here the 40 years. Well, let's point a little head. But I've been here a lot of years. 32 or so in the total. Three back in the 80s and then 29 now. Sister Didi and I have been here that amount of time. That's an, it's an incredible blessing. But I want to say to you what hit me on that little illustration of the university. 40 years is gone. It's over. We can't ride that horse anymore. We have to focus on what are you going to do now? We're not going to sit back and enjoy our laurels. You know, those are the wreaths they used to put around the Olympian Olympic winners. You know, everybody could see, oh, I was the fastest runner 15 years ago. Nobody cares if you can't run fast anymore because you can't compete anymore. And Praise Chapel, as the body of Christ, as a representative of the kingdom of God, we want to be active in the world. Souls still need to be saved. That outreach that was done in the Valley Mall, lives that are touched, that's, that's, a, that's an ongoing, everyday thing that God has for all of his people, for his body, for his church, for the bride of Christ. So I want to talk about vision and I've titled this message, A Focused Life. And I know it's going to be a little difficult because I'm I'm putting some groundwork down. I'm going to read one scripture. I have some other scriptures I'm going to use, but I'm going to read one scripture out of Proverbs chapter 29. If you can turn in your Bibles to that. Proverbs chapter 29, verse number 18. 
Proverbs chapter 29, verse number 18. When you're there, just say amen. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, in verse number 18, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keeps the law happy is he. In the, in the New King James, and I'll go over this again in a little bit since we get a little momentum here. In the New King James, it says it in a different manner. It says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. This is about seeing things that normally you can't see because we're so used to walking in the flesh. We don't really have a good understanding of walking in the Spirit. Every one of us in this place has been chosen by God for a reason. God saved you at that time, brought Christ into your life, wherever it was, whether it was on a street corner, in a church service, at a baptism, at a wedding, at a party, at somebody's funeral, God came into your life. The Lord Jesus became Savior of your life for a reason. You have a job to discover what that reason is. Because God doesn't waste his time just doing things for nothing. There's a purpose that your life is called to fulfill. You may not be the next Billy Graham, but you are something in the kingdom of God. And if you think the superstars are everything, you're foolish because it's all the working people that God uses that he gifts to make things happen. Billy Graham himself, probably one of the biggest organizations for the longest of time with one of the greatest testimonies, will often say, I only have the vision, it's God's people that make things work. It's what a senior pastor does. A good leader has the vision. He can see the, 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 the direction God has taken him in, but, but the people have to link themselves with that vision, and they have to put themselves involved in the things that God is doing. Can you say amen? amen. So let me ask Brother Frank in the back there. Brother Frank, if you would stand, and would you pray over this message as we launch off this morning? Mm. Amen, amen. Let's talk about vision, if I can, for a little bit. <clears throat> when I got saved in the 70s, my pastor, Pastor Mike Neville, was preaching about vision. And he was, he was trying to get a lot of the young people that were in there that, that were catching on to what he was preaching. And I didn't understand vision, but I remember one time he told everybody to close their eyes. He said, close your eyes. Close your eyes and picture yourself doing something for the kingdom of God. And he said, right now with your eyes closed, you're imagining that. That imagination is something that, yes, the enemy can use against you. But it's something that God put in you so that you could envision yourself in a place that you're not now doing something that you're not doing now for the kingdom of God and, and touching people that right now it's not happening. But you can envision that in your mind. You can see yourself doing that. When you and I were growing up, everybody in here, as they, as they were small, we all wanted to be something. We wanted to be a fireman. We wanted to be a, a policeman. Some of us got really close to policeman, but we're on the other side of the law. So we all wanted something. We wanted to, we wanted to, uh, uh, we wanted to work on cars because our, our family had cars. Uh, there's, uh, there's probably, and I remember one of the sisters, in the Almani church, when Sister Didi and I first came in in the 80s, that she was raised with her father and all her brothers being mechanics. And this sister was an incredible mechanic. 
I mean incredible. I, I remember the first time I went to go visit them after we had taken over the church. I went by their house to see them. It was getting late into the evening. I was on my way home from I don't know what. And, and they were out fixing their car. And, and my, my dear brother, the husband, was holding the flashlight. I'd never seen that before in my life. Never seen that. And I came up and I go, hey, what's happening? How are you guys doing? He goes, oh, good, good, Pastor. Hey, just came by to say hi, man. What are you doing? He goes, I'm holding the flashlight. <laughs> I, I, I said, uh, what's wrong? Uh, my wife, she's making some adjustments. And it's not running right. And, I'm, and it's just not kicking in my head. And I'm going, and, and, and you're holding the, the flashlight? How come you're holding the flashlight? He goes, I ain't no mechanic, but she is. And I remember going, you're, you're a mechanic? She goes, yeah, my dad was a mechanic. My brother's a mechanic. I know everything about mechanics. I can rebuild an engine. I can do brakes. I can do I said, oh, my God, man. This brother holding a flashlight doesn't know what he has, man. <laughs> has no idea what God has given him. We all had things that we envisioned ourselves doing. We all had things that we could see ourselves involved in, that we could see ourselves participating in, working at a certain place, doing a certain kind of job. Here's a good one, driving a certain kind of car. Yeah, that's right. I remember being a young teenager, man. I thought to myself, I remember my first car is going to be, mm, I'm a, yeah, it's going to be a nice car. It was a 66 Opel Cadet. My first car was a 66 Opel Cadet. It, I put that magic, what's that magic stuff they used to, they go into the, the junkyard, remember the commercials, they, they go into the junkyard and they put it on there and it makes the junk, what's it called? New finish, yeah. Oh, I bought two bottles of that thing. <laughs> and I tried to make that car shine with everything I could, couldn't do it. But I remember before I got the car, I envisioned myself with a car. My dad came up to me one day and he says, you want to make some money, I can get you a car. And I said, yeah, what do you do? He said, I'm, I'm remodeling a house, you come help me. And, and we'll get you a car. I, I didn't know what he meant was I'm going to come help him finish that job. And the folks there were going to give me a car. I didn't know that. So when he said we're going to get you a car, I'm thinking, cha-ching, man. I'm going to give me a good, oh, man, I'm going to pick the right one. Instead, he handed me a set of keys. See that little red car right there? That, that's your payment for the help you did. And, and, and I remember looking at it going, it didn't even have wheel, hubcaps on the wheels. They were just black, you know, and I said, oh, okay. And, and I, I took it because it was wheels. And I drove that thing. I drove it for a long time. I had my eyes on Monte Carlos, but I drove that thing for a long time. You were able to envision yourself doing something. You were able to see yourself wanting a certain thing, uh, driving a certain thing. Here, ladies, wearing a certain thing. Oh, you didn't like that one? That was a real good one. I watched you ladies look at somebody else's shoes going, oh, I like those. That's because you can see yourself wearing them on your feet. You can do that with everything. And God has called us to do that Amen. with the kingdom of God. Amen. What does the Bible mean? That where there, where, there is, where there is no vision. What does the Bible mean when it says where there is no vision, the people perish? Because vision is is everything. Now the correct translation so that we could break it down is where there is no New King James, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. This vision, this revelation is an ongoing thing that God is doing in our lives, around our lives, and with our lives. And one of the biggest problems that we have is that we don't live our lives with any kind of clarity. We don't focus on anything. It is like a, a, a hunter who goes hunting squirrels, but he uses a big shotgun. And, and from 100 feet, it's just going to shoot up and fall on the ground because he's not aiming at anything. He's just, he's just throwing everything wide. We've done that with our careers. We've done that with our lives. We did that like, like whatever. What do you do when you grow up? I don't know. Get high. One of the biggest problems is we come into the kingdom of God and God saved us for a reason. He saved us. He touched us. He called you. He touched your life that night on the corner, at the church, at whatever it was, the concert. He touched your life for a purpose. Look at your neighbor say, for a purpose. And what God has been trying to do in many people's lives is get them to get some clarity. 
There is a reason why I brought you to myself. There's a reason why I called you to myself. I want you to get some focus in your life. Focus in your life means aiming at some things and accomplishing some things. We don't do that very often. We, we do whatever. Whatever. Friday, Friday night, the harvesters, I, I, that was one of my main points. You've been chosen. You were chosen by God. You didn't just, you didn't just get saved. When did you get saved? Uh, like, uh, Huawei. You were picked, handpicked by God for a reason. There is something that only your life fits into like a puzzle. There is something only your life can do. And you might think to yourself, I'm not really that talented. Talented. I'm not really that good. I, I don't really have that many skills. God's not asking for skills, talent, and all those abilities. He's just asking for you to be available. He's saying, can you make yourself available for me? If you can make yourself. Ooh, I'm getting excited. i got to stop. If you can make yourself available, he'll take care of whatever lacks in your life. You often, and we often make this mistake, thinking that I, that's not in my, it's not in my personality, it's, in my, it's not in my makeup, it's, it's not something I have skills in. Oh man, you're a prime candidate. Why does God want to use people that, that don't have the skill to do that? I'll tell you why, so that you can, can't do that. You can't do that. When something good happens, you go, wow. Wow. Man, God used you powerfully. Yeah, I don't know why. Wow. See, that's what God's looking for. Now, I don't have this message, but you're going to get it. <laughs> I'm going to drop this seed in you, right? Remember this seed. What we really need is an amateur spirit. Okay? We need, we need an amateur spirit. Because an amateur plays the game because they love the game. Not because they have a contract. An amateur golfer plays golf because he enjoys golf. Not because he's making $2 million on this course. Those are professionals. God doesn't need professionals. He needs amateurs. Amateurs that will do his kingdom business for the love. For the love, of, for the love of all that God is doing in our lives. This is what Jesus said to the disciples and those that were following him. In John chapter 15, verse number 12 to verse number 16. He said, this is my commandment to you. That you love one another. Say it with me. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you ought to love one another. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for their friends. Jesus said, you are my friends if you, if you do, if, say it. Man, that's a big word in the Bible, folks. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, Jesus said, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I made known to you. You did not choose me. Let me say it again. You did not choose me. Oh, when I gave my life to the Lord, yeah, I remember that. You know, that was incredible. God chose that day to meet you wherever it was, whoever it was that was witnessing to you, whoever it was that was talking to you, whoever it was that was, that was reading you a, a verse out of the Bible, who, whoever, young or old, it doesn't matter, God met you. And Jesus became Savior of your life. He moved into your heart. All things became new. Ooh, you were born again. You were born again. Jesus said, you didn't choose me. I chose you, and I appointed you. That's a big word. Appointed you means I already put a tag on you. I put you in a position. You're, you're, you're already ready. You're already there, but i got to prepare you as you go. And I've appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, and that whatever, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give to you. We quote that one all the time. Oh, Jesus, gimme, give gimme, give gimme, give gimme, because my name is Jimmy. I'm sorry if your name is Jimmy. I don't mean that. But you know what I'm saying? We ask God. This is, Lord, can you do this for me? Lord, can you help me here? Lord, could you get, could you make this situation? But you have what you need to ask yourself. Uh, uh, you, need to, you need to say to yourself, am I giving myself over to the Lord? Am I presenting to my Heavenly Father? Am I presenting to the Lord Jesus all of me? 
See, our problem is in our culture. And I'm going to hit the song, even though I like the song, but, but I'm going to hit the song. You know that song that's on the radio that goes, I'm just a nobody trying to tell anybody about somebody who can change any, you guys know what looks like song? Y'all breaking my heart, man. I'm just a nobody trying to tell anybody about somebody who can change everybody. He can change anybody. Can he? Did he change you? Okay, here's the problem. You're not a nobody. That's not a correct statement. You are not a nobody. In, in your fleshly mind, you might think so, but not when it comes to the kingdom of God. Because God doesn't choose nobodies. He doesn't choose nobodies. He doesn't choose anybody's. He chooses somebody's. He brings us out of the world and he turns us into somebody's. I'm a somebody. Look at your neighbors. I'm a somebody. I'm a somebody. Now, why is this so important? Because in light, as a believer, as a follower of Christ, okay, it is important. Very important. I don't know how many of these points I'm going to get, Will, so you're just going to have to flow with it. It is important that we identify a clear vision for our life's purpose. Knowing that God has touched me, called me, whether it was many years back, like some of us, or whether it was just a few weeks back or a few days back. That happened for a reason. Your journey in now is to grow, mature, and discover what that purpose is that is in your life. Are you following me, church? you got to identify it. Why does it say that in the scripture? Why does it say that, that where there is no vision? Because vision identifies what you see. When you have vision, you, you, and we're not talking about in the natural, what do you see? Where do you see yourself at? Where do you see? Don't get a job if you can't see yourself getting promotions in that job. Years ago, I went in, went in for a job. I tried to switch from doing just regular work into a company. I went into a city, and I put an application there. I went to do the test for electrical. I passed. There was only, out of the, like, 55, 60 guys that took the test, there was only a handful that passed the test. And I did the interview. And when I sat down with these guys, I think it was a, one, of the head, uh, one of the heads of the building and whoever it was. I don't know. And there were three people and, and a local contractor that works for the city. And they asked me a bunch of questions, and I answered their questions. And they said, what are you looking for? And then they said this, what are you looking for? Because in this job, there's no place to go. There's no place to move up. There's no promotions to move up. There's, no, there's nothing to look forward to. There's, not, you know, there's, there's nothing. There's, not, there's, there's nothing. So, so what are you looking for? And I said, well, I guess I'm not looking for this job. <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of statement is that to, to talk to a future employee that's looking for a job to tell him, hey, this place ain't got nothing for you. You, you just, I don't, you're, you're asking me, do I, am I going to put all my cookies in this job? Heck no. Mine are in the kingdom. Hallelujah. Mine are in God's hands. God will open a door. If it's not God's will for me to work in a place, he'll not, he'll not open that door. But can I be sensitive to that? Can I know instead of walking away with a big puddle? Oh my God. See, your life has a purpose. It has a meaning to it. Let me ask you a couple of questions. What do you want to be said about your life when you stand before Jesus? Because we're all standing for him on that great judgment day. We are all going to stand before God. We'll stand before him not like the world will stand, not, by, not, not like unsaved. But we're going to all give an answer, the Bible says. What do we want said about us when we stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? What is it that you want? If you, if you closed your eyes right now, and I, and I asked you to do this, close your eyes and picture yourself doing something for the Lord that, that you think is beyond you. Could your mind do that? Yes, it can. Yes, it can. What do you want most in your life? What, what's what's the, the, the biggest thing that you want most to accomplish in your life? If all it is is getting a better job, if all it is is moving to a better house, if all of this is just getting a house or just getting an apartment or just getting a trailer or whatever it is that you want to live in or wherever it is you want, if that's all it is, then you don't have vision. Right. See, because all those things God knows you need. He knows you need a roof over your head. He knows you need wheels to get around. 
He knows you need things in life. The question God looks for is, how do you see the kingdom of God in your eyes? In what you're going to do for me? Because God can make all the provisions for you if you'll put him first in your life. You know the best way to help someone that needs discipline in their life? Is to get them to identify a clear vision for their life. Where are you going? I don't know. Most of us, that's our biggest answer. Because we're not sure. And, and if you don't focus, if you focus on nothing, that's exactly what you'll get. If you focus on nothing, I've, I've told so many people that, that have looked for better jobs. I said, go apply at a big company. Ah, they never have, they'd never hire me there. Probably not. But if it's God's will, he'll open a door for you. Ah, you don't understand. I got a record. I don't know anybody who doesn't have a record. In the, late, in the late 70s, I was working for little contractors around, doing things like that. I hadn't even taken a journeyman's test yet. And I, I, needed, to, I needed a better job. So I started applying in, in, somebody challenged me. I started applying in big companies, aerospace, aerospace. Did I say aerospace? Didn't uh, Northrop used to be in Pico? I applied there. I went over to Burbank, I applied in Lockheed. I, at all the, I went down to Douglas. I went all over the place. And put, and I, I, at my, my brain thought I was crazy. I went back to work. I went back to work, got angry at a contractor, quit him. Two weeks later, went back and asked for my job back. <laughs> I had to go back and eat crow, man. You know, I was young. I was young. I was, I was all of 20 years old, you know, and, and, or maybe not even that, 19, 20 years old. And I remember after about 30 days, maybe about 45 days, a month and a half, I got a telegram in the mail on a job. And I looked at it and I said, whoa, I'm going to go to this interview. Now, I was already scared that I couldn't, I couldn't make the interview. I, oh, man, I'm going to choke. I know I'm going to choke because I've, I've been a choker all my life. I've been choking since I was young. Every interview I've ever had, they probably, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, this is gas. <clears throat> we'll call you. <laughs> Thank you. Y'all felt that way too. I remember when I went for the interview, and they asked me all kinds of questions. The guy that was over all the all the the trades, he's a Cubano. He had an accent, and I tried not to laugh. And he goes, "I like you, kid." And I'm thinking, "Well, oh, I don't know if that's good." You know what he said? This is what he said. I'm going to give you a chance. He, he didn't say, you're going to be fine. He just said, I'm going to give you a chance. See, that, that's how God works. See, that's how God gives you a small opening. He puts a hope in you. He, you, you, you think of something in your mind. You dream something up of something that, that you may want to do. And God puts a small little, a small portion of a hope in there. And he wants to do that when you put your mind on his kingdom. When you start having a vision, a vision with kingdom purpose, because without clear vision, we live aimlessly. We have no focus in our life. We're just, we're just doing. We're just, we're just going wherever. Where are you going? I don't know. Where are you going? I'm going with you. Because there's not a focus in our life for, 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 uh, for logistics, disciplines, divine disciplines of God. Prayer, God's word, things that are happening. I want to be part of what God is doing. If, if you don't have a vision, if you don't see yourself being used by God in the kingdom of God, then you just aimlessly come and go. And then it doesn't matter to you whether you come to church, whether you go to a Bible study, whether you're involved in this, whether you're involved in that. I got Jesus because I got my card. It says so. What does it mean to be, to be, to be aimless? It means you have no purpose. It means you're living... For God, who is, who is the ultimate of all creators, who created everything in a word, in the waving of his hand, and he saved your life for a reason, and yet you're trapped in that no purpose. When God says, I didn't save you for no reason, I have a reason, but if you don't seek me, you won't find me. Do you remember a couple of years back, we did a conference on why? It's the problem that a lot of people have. You don't know your why. When you know why you do something, you do it differently. 
When you know why you're going to do something for somebody, you do it differently. If you're just going to go do a favor and it's no big deal, somebody asks you to go do a favor, you're going to go do a favor. If you find out why, you do the, you do the favor differently. You do the whole thing differently. Uh, you know, somebody asked me if I could go help and fix their grandma. Their grandma's got a problem with the electricals. I'm just going to look at the house. You know, I'll, I'll go do him a favor. He's a good friend. I'll go there. When you find out why, because grandma's been in trouble and things have been happening, somebody went in there and did the job wrong and everything's bad. All of a sudden, you change everything. No, I'm going to fix it. No, I'm gonna, you know what? I'm going to change the whole thing. I'm going to fix the whole thing because they should have did it right the first time. Yeah. See, that's the problem with not knowing why. Not, why did God save you? He saved you for a reason. And you've got to find out. You've got to know. What does the Bible mean when it says that the people perish? It means you miss out on life's destiny. If you, if you, if you have no vision, if there's no newness of God's direction in your life, or like it says in the New King James, if there's no revelation, it means that you're, you miss out on your life destiny. And there's a destiny. Every purpose has a destiny in the kingdom of God. When you don't have a vision... We squander our destiny. We treat life like it just doesn't matter. How do you, where do you see yourself? Like when? Like tomorrow? <laughs> no, down the line. I don't know. You remember the buzzards on the Looney Tune cartoons? Remember that? I'm bringing home a baby bumblebee. Won't my mama be surprised? That's all their dream. What's it? Let's go get a bumblebee. Without a vision, you'll never step into your destiny. Without the ability to see it in your mind, dream it in your heart, you'll never take steps in it. What does it mean in the New King James where it says the people cast off restraint? Without a revelation, without a vision, people cast off restraint. It means that you do not use your resources in a way that helps you walk in that vision that God has. When you cast off restraints, it means you just toss everything out and nothing has meaning. It ta you toss your resources away. Nothing, nothing, nothing works well. Nothing falls into place. Nothing grows in that attempt that you're doing because you're not focusing on what's ahead. Now, I, I told you it's going to be hard for me to finish, but we're going to be on this subject for a while. Can you say amen? amen. So you, you, you pray for me. I, I'm going to tell you a story. I read this uh, just recently, there's a, there's a man, I did a little research too, so I would know a little bit more about it. His name is Victor Frankel, very popular man, uh, Victor Emil Frankel. Uh, he was born in 1905, and he died in 1997. He was an Austrian neurologist. He was a psychiatrist. But the big, 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 big thing is that he was a Holocaust survivor. He survived the Nazi Holocaust that, that, just, that just killed millions of people. Okay, And he de devoted his life, and this is where it happened, in, in the Nazi death camps, where he was as a young man, he began, to, he began to see how things worked in people's lives. He devoted his life to studying and understanding and promoting meaning. Your life has meaning. Your life, 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 your life. Everyone's life. Point to somebody. Look at your neighbor and say, your life has meaning. That means there's a reason why you're alive. There's a reason why you were born. No, it was just like my mom and dad, like they knew each other, and it's like, oh, there I was. Oh, no. No, that, that's, that's the outer story. The inner story is different. You're just not looking at it. You're not seeing it. Where did Rahab the harlot come from? How did she fit into one of the greatest books and chapters of faith for the kingdom of God? And yet we still throw the harlot at the end of her name. I'll find that lady and ask her a couple of questions when I get to heaven. But this man, Victor Frankel, was in the death camps. And I'm going to paraphrase his quotes because I, 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 couldn't, I didn't get it word for word. And this is what he said, this is what he noticed in the death camps, of why so, in the death camps, why so many people perished and died before they should have, okay? Not, not, not by force and all the treacherous and ugly and, and horrible stuff that was done, but some of them that just gave up on life. They gave up on life because they could no longer see anything in the future. And this is what he said. He said, he said what, what you believe about your future 
will impact your life greater than what you've experienced in your past. No matter how bad that past is, your past cannot control your future. But what you believe about your future, if you don't see your future as better. Oh, I see better things happening. Hallelujah. I see good things coming up. I see gooder things. Things are getting gooder and gooder. I don't know if that's a word, but I like saying it. It's going to get gooder and gooder. How many times do you tell yourself that when you're in the midst of a trial and a battle and a struggle, when all hell is breaking loose? You need to speak to yourself. Even the psalmist David said, you got to speak to yourself in Psalms. Get the word of God out. Read it to yourself out loud so that your ears hear it, not just your heart. What you believe about your future keeps you alive. He said, he said that, that a lot of the people in those Nazi de death camps could not see any future that could ever exist in their life. And because of that, they gave up on life. Many of them, many of them, probably millions of them weren't put into the gas chambers. Of them. They just died because they could no longer see a future that was worth living for. Are you following me, church? He wrote a book. His famous book is Man's Search for Meaning. And it tells the story in that book. I, I went through and looked at the summary. It tells the story of how he survived the Nazi Holocaust. And, and what he had to do, it says, is that he had to find a personal meaning in the experience. There's a reason why... We're going, there's a reason why I'm going through this. There's a reason why this is happening. And when he had that, when he grabbed that, it gave him the will to live through it, no matter how bad it was. And yes, it was bad. I've heard him speak. It was bad. But he, it, it gave him something to live through it. And, and it says, in the book it says, in the, in the opening it says, that the majority of the people in the concentration camps who survived, survived because they kept looking ahead, they kept seeing a future, they know somehow God's, go, God's got to do something, other people got to do something, other countries got to do something, this can't last forever, and they stayed alive. You know that when you're in the middle of a trial and a battle, that if you're giving up, you're in trouble. If you just start wanting to throw in the towel, you're in trouble because the devil loves that. The devil loves that. Any, any beast, any, what do they call them um, that are picking on people? Any bully loves it when you're, oh, man, you, he's going to get up. I got you now. You're so scared of me. I don't even have to hit you. <laughs> what does our life vision need? I don't have the ability to finish this, okay? Let me, let me go as far as I can. Our life vision includes seeking. What are you seeking right now? What are you seeking? What are you looking for? What do you got your eye on? Hey, hey, hey. What are you seeking after? Jesus said if you seek, you'll find. If you knock, the door gets open to you. That's pursuing. What are you pursuing? That's one of the problems we have. We're not pursuing anything. We're just living life like day by day, like, like whatever. So how are things? Good, man, good. So how do you see, man? Yeah, we're in the middle of the year. I, yeah, whatever. We're in the middle of the year. I don't know. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to say? Pursuing. You got to pursue to know what it is. That God wants you to do. That God has for you. you got to pursue him. you got to ask of the Lord. You have to do something. You have to be something. You have to do. You have to be. And, 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 and you have to search out how he wants you to spend your life's resources. Are you listening to me? Because everybody has resources. You've got time. You've got affections. You've got money. You've got talent. You've got energy. Now, you might not think you have money. But you need to go to countries where the money that you make, you'd be living in a Taj Mahal. Do you want to excel in your spiritual walk with God? Do you want to excel in the natural things, in the relational things of people and connecting with people in those aspects in your life? And a lot of people just don't know where to start. And so that's why I'm preaching this. Because you've got to start defining. It starts with defining a clear life vision. God saved me, and I know he has a purpose for my life. 
and I'm not going to slow down and I'm not going to stop until I step into that and I realize now the doors are starting to open. you got to knock on those doors. You have to ask. M many people do not end up actually pursuing the things that they hope to achieve in their life because they don't know where to start. And I thank God that I listened to my pastor when he said, you can be doing anything in the kingdom of God that God will let you dream of. Anything. He used to sit us at a table and he said, you guys are going to be preaching for each other. You're going to have churches and you're going to be sharing. You're going to be sharing. And that's exactly what it, we used to rent 16 millimeter movies. And we still had the, the movidas on us, you know. So I would rent the movie for a Friday night and they'd mail it to us on Thursday. And I, and I would tell them, I'll mail it back. First thing Monday. So I would show it on Friday, share it with another church who showed it on Saturday, and then another church who showed the movie on, on Sunday, and then I sent it back. We saw it three times in three different places, outreaches, flyers, and everybody mailed it back to them and only paid for one showing. I'm confessing it right now. Because when, you, when you're young, you still got the movidas, man. You still got mom, can I borrow the car? I'm just going to go to the store. You pick up four or five people, give them a ride here and there, make some money. Man, if Uber was around when I first started driving, man, I'm telling you. That would have been my first job. God is more concerned with what we do and why we do it than where we do it. What we do and why we do it. So what defines a focused life? What are the components? What are they made up of? Two things. Overall, life vision, and your life's goals. Okay? What is your primary purpose in life? What you, if you don't have a clear life vision with goals that you can see and an action plan. Everybody say an action plan. You don't have an action plan. You'll go nowhere in life. You'll go nowhere. You'll sit with an interview and you'll answer the wrong questions. I'll bet you nobody thought of sitting at an interview and saying, so what, what are you really looking forward to? And you thought in your mind, I want your job. But I know people that have said that. And those people got the job. Because that's somebody that a company wants. They want, they're looking ahead. They're sitting here, we're going to put them on a computer, but they want my job. That means something. That's a go-getter. Go that's a hustler. That's somebody who will work. That's somebody that will probably want some promotions. You gotta have some life goals. You gotta have an action plan. Well, yeah, I'm trusting that God will change. God can't change your plan if you don't have a plan. Yes, God does change plans. Sometimes you'll set a direction, you'll want something, and and and, and it's awesome. And he'll step in and he'll change it, manipulate it, move it. Sometimes you'll rearrange it a little bit. But if you don't have one, he's got nothing to work with. Close your Bibles. I can't finish this. It's going to take too long. Way too long. Most of us don't live by calendars or schedules. We just try to remember everything. I'm guilty of that. So I kept calendars everywhere. I got a calendar in the kitchen. There's four calendars in the office. I got a calendar on my phone. I got a calendar inside my iPad. And there's times I'm still missing the mark. Many, many years ago, Sister Didi went out, we went out for lunch, and we were having an, a hamburger sitting down, and all of a sudden it dawns on me, I was supposed to be doing a funeral. <laughs> calendar in the kitchen, calendar in the car, calendar on my phone, calendar here. I had calendars everywhere, but this thing right here wasn't working well. <laughs> Prayer time. Days of fasting. How do you study your word? Do you have some discipline to that? Or is it just like whenever? It's amazing that we'll buy a new toy and we'll go through the entire manual. We want to know everything about it. We'll put a new TV up, man, go through the whole thing. Remote control. And there in the Bible, off to the side there. I can quote John 3.16. So the world does. Spiritually, relationally, how's the family, people around you you care about, your friends. Do your friends get witness to you? 
Do your friends get witnessed by you? Do you witness to them? Are they hearing about the Jesus that you serve? Or do you live for a Jesus that doesn't look like he's very hot stuff? When you look at the marketplace for jobs, not just take any job, any job. Any job will pull you out of church. Sometimes any job will keep you from ministry. Sometimes any job will keep you from fellowship. And sometimes that any job could keep you away from your family. How's your spending? How's your stewardship? Your giving, your saving, your investing. Everything matters in the kingdom of God. God watches everything. When you close your eyes, what do you see? God wants you to be a person of vision. He's got a plan for your life. I know he's got one plan, and that's to save the world. But you fit in it. I fit in it. You have a place. I have a place. We all have a place. And your place is probably different than somebody over here or somebody over there or, somebody, or someone in another church. But it's your place. And God is waiting for you to start pursuing it, seeing it in your vision, seeing it in your mind, and start to ask God, God, help me. I, I, I see that. And if that's how you want to use my life, God, show me where I need to go, what I need to do. And, and you need to start getting a plan. Let's stand to, stand to our feet. You know we make plans all the time. Your health is in trouble. Woo. You start planning your meals. Come on now, it's a popular thing right now. Which is good, right? Start planning your meals. You start telling yourself, every day I got to go walk. I'm going to go walk a couple miles. I'm going to go walk down the street. I'm going to go across. I'm going to come all the way back. That's like two miles, maybe two and a quarter miles. I'm going to walk. But I live in a bad neighborhood. So do I. I walk with a big cane. I do. I'm telling you the honest truth. I have a huge cane from Mexico. It's scary. It's big. And I got to tell you, it's not because of people I'm afraid of. It's the perritos, man. <laughs> I don't know what it is. So I'm thinking about putting some bacon, bacon bits in my pocket so that they won't bite me and they'll, they'll think I'm a friend. Let's bow our heads. Would you all across the building? Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray for these lives that are here right now, God. So unique they are, God. So special they are. And yet some of, the, some of them don't see themselves in that. Some of them don't see themselves in the value, God, that you have placed on them. So right now, Lord, as I pray, I, I ask you, Lord, that you would help them. Help them right now to see that there's more in them that they know. That there's more about them than they know. But you know, God. And there's something unique, something awesome, something special that only their lives can be a part of. And I pray right now, Father, that you take an opportunity. Take an opportunity, Holy Spirit, to begin to minister and work within our hearts. I want to pray for people right now. I'm going to ask you to come down to this altar. I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm going to pray for, I want to pray for people before we leave who want God to restir their hearts, to restir their vision, to restir their lives for the kingdom of God. I want you to come and stand up here for, with me. Come on. Come and stand at this altar. Just come because we're going to pray. Have you ever told your kids, you let me see what kind of friends you have. And I'll tell you what kind of person you're going to be as you grow up. We used to say those things. Do we say them to ourselves? What's my focus? What do I see? God's going to help us this morning. Because some of you here need to be dreamers. Kingdom dreamers. You need to be the people that God can take your dreams and bring them and make them happen. Make them happen in spite of what you're lacking. Did you hear that? In spite of what you're lacking, God can do it. But you have to pursue him. And you have to let him. Turn your hands over like this so that you can receive from the Lord. Those of you out there, either lift your hands up or stretch them towards these that are here. And we're going to pray for them. Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, God, we pray 
for these who are here. We lift them up to you, brothers and sisters in Christ, young, older, Father, moms, dads, cousins, whoever they might be, Lord, married, single, whatever their category is. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray for these hearts, Father. There is more to their life than what they see. There is more to who they are than just the place where they work and the job that they have and the paycheck they collect. There is a destiny that their lives have, God. And right now, Father, they, they may not see it. They might be confused about some things. They might be confused because so many battles have taken place in their life. So many struggles have happened. So many hills have come their way. So many attacks and, 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 and difficulties. And God, the, the greater the battle, it's because, it's because the war, Father, the war we can't win without you, Lord. And I pray, Father, because there's destinies. There's men and women who are called of God. They're standing at this altar. They are called of God to do incredible things, God, that only you can show them and only you can direct them. There are men and women, Father, who are here and they're thinking in their mind, I can't, there's no way. I think he's done with me, oh God. You don't look at our age, Father. You look at our hearts. And right now, our hearts are young and they're open to you. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you stir these hearts, Father. Stir these hearts and these lives. Make them dreamers, God. Get them, Lord, to close their eyes. Help them. Give them dreams at night where they see themselves being used by you, Lord. Give them dreams at night where they see themselves doing something for your kingdom, for your glory. Father, I bind the enemy who is a liar. He lies to us. He's been lying from the beginning. He lied to, to the first man and woman in the, in the garden, and he's been lying to us consistently, Lord. I bind him and I rebuke him in the name of Jesus. I speak vision. I speak vision into these lives. And I pray, God, that you help them pursue, that they become seekers. Lord Jesus, you said if you seek me, you will find me. In the name of Jesus, Lord, help us, help us to find the will of God for our lives, to walk through whatever door you open for us, God. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. In the name of Jesus, Lord. These women that are here, these men that are here, Father, Maybe they've been thinking for a long time, God, that there's no way it can't happen. They're not qualified. They're not quality. And, Lord, they're looking at it through their eyes of flesh, God. They can't see it through your eyes, Lord. You chose us, Lord Jesus. We thought we chose you, but in all reality, you chose us. And you've called us. And you desire us. Help us to make ourselves available to you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Man, go ahead and give the Lord a great big hand clap. Mighty God, mighty God, mighty God. We have, we have a new year. Because 40 years is, is done. You may not realize this, but some of the destiny that God has for you can be right there in front of you. Right there in front of you. Amen. Sister Sonia. Hey, Sister Sonia. Come on up. Would you bring Sister Sonia up here? Any, anybody, right, anybody other than Sister Sonia here who's got something going on this week you need prayer over before we let you go home? Would you come so that we can pray for you? Sister Sonia is going for a procedure. Amen. We prayed for pa Pastor Alfonso. He's recovering. He's going to be fine. He'll be here soon, maybe in another, in about a week or so. But if you have something that's going on right now that you need prayer for, don't, don't, don't wait. Don't hesitate. Just come on up here, and we'll believe God for you. Come on up. Yeah, don't, don't stop. Come on up. Give me some other prayer warriors to come up so that we got some. There you go. Jesus' name. There you go. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. Those of you join us, stretch your hands up towards these that are here. Father, in the name of Jesus, whatever the situation might be, God, whatever it is in each one of their lives, Father, you know. You know exactly what it is, exactly what they need, Father. And we speak the blood of Jesus, Lord. We do, Lord God, in obedience to your word. 
We lay hands on those who may need a healing, who may need deliverance, who may need freedom, God, who may need, Lord Jesus, a miracle, Lord Jesus. We pray for them right now, God. If, they're, if it's a procedure like with Sister Sonia, God, we pray that you guide the hands of the surgeon, Father. Guide the hands of those doctors. You gave them the wisdom. You give all of man the wisdom that we have. I pray, God, that you give her strength to recover and let your Holy Spirit just be the strength she needs to recuperate well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Give the Lord some praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Don't forget those announcements that they made. This, uh, this service, if you want to go on that fishing trip, they're going to need a deposit. Uh, you can put your name down, but you're going to have to bring that deposit at least within the next couple of weeks. We're going to have a great time. Have a great afternoon. God bless you. Again, be patient with us for our Monday nights. They will be coming back. God bless everybody.